All right. So today we enter into a slightly different phase of the of the book of Hosea. We're going to be looking at Hosea chapter four, verses uh, verse one through chapter six, verse three. And the reason I say it's slightly different is that um, normally we'd like to go verse by verse. Um, that would be a very long passage, and frankly, it's a little repetitive. These are these are messages that Hosea compiled over a thirty or forty year span, um, and they tended to be the same kind of message. That doesn't mean it wasn't important. But just to remember that as we look through it, we're gonna do a little bit more skimming than we usually do. So I'm not gonna hit every verse. So if I skip over your favorite verse and you have a question, um, I'll take it down and we'll see if we can do something about it. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move along here too. So let's, let's start in chapter three and, uh, or chapter four. Again, just to re recall where we are with um, our, our friend, um, Gomer. Uh, again, where this is uh, about, it's about the prostitute uh, in the book of Hosea. And uh, as we're looking along, we, we're trying to, we're in this spot where we've moved out of the Hosea's family as a symbol of God and Israel's relationship down to now Hosea's message of God's judgment and love. You're going to see the same pattern, though, and this is kind of the important thing, is that um, one of the thing I was kind of amused at was half the commentaries I looked at, looked at chapter six as one long message. Now, there's nothing inspired about the chapter divisions. And when you look at literature, you say, well, this topic, you know, every topic, every time there's a judgment, there's a, a redemption, there's a restoration. And when you start to look at the, the whole book that way, it makes a lot more sense. But th that means that the chapter six, verse one is not the beginning of a new topic. It's actually the conclusion of the previous topic, because now in chapter six, verses one through three is the restoration. So chapters four and five are about the judgment. Chapter six, verses one through three is the judgment. And then a new topic starts in chapter six, verse four. I think that's a helpful way to look at it. And it's, it's important that you look at it the way that it was intended to be read. And that's Hosea is obviously giving us this pattern over and over and over again. So we're going to look at God's lawsuit for no knowledge of God, uh, chapters four and five, and then um, as we get to chapter 15, chapter five, verse 15, the last half of that, and then down to six, three, we'll conclude that way. So let's read together. Uh, chapter four, verses one through three, listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery, they employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes. <coughs> Along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, also the fish of the sea disappear. So one of the things we want to look at, again, as we, as we begin, uh, just to kind of recall ourselves, where is Hosea? Now, what I've got before you, if you can see the, the chart, uh, let me close down the light a little bit. And again, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but it gives you an idea that um, Hosea is this wide or lighter stripe here, where you've got the king of Isaiah, or Uzziah, in uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And this was in chapter one. This is just a recall of that. But also in the north, we have Jeroboam, and none of the other kings are mentioned. But what's the unique factor about all those other kings? What did happen to them? They were all assassinated except for two. So a way of, of Jeroboam's line, uh, uh, Joash's, or Jehu's line coming to an end and to a violent end, and there'd be nothing but violence to end it all as well. So as we, as we move into it, we're kind of getting into this uh, kind of territory. The other thing I wanted to remind you, and I think we touched on it last week, we're going to talk about the nature of a covenant today. Remember the, the covenant? Um, and again, John Murray uh, let me start with the other one first. Um, Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley. A covenant is a solemn promise that functions as a legitimate instrument to define a relationship of loyalty. A solemn promise that functions as a legal instrument to define a relationship of loyalty. Can you think of a covenant that you might have had been witness to or aware of that happened in the past week? Anybody? Yeah, Mark, uh, Mark Carrera and, and Alyssa uh, Garrison got married. 
Yeah. And, I okay. And and what did they what did they issue, what did they share between each other as they concluded the ceremony? They shared vows, right? They shared vows of covenant loyalty towards each other. And people who were in the audience were witnesses to that covenant that they made with each other. And so a marriage is a type of covenant. Um, it's again, a solemn promise that functions as a legal instrument to define a relationship of loyalty. And a marriage is just one type of covenant. Isn't promise? It's a little bit more strong than a promise. Uh, in terms of you're pledging your whole being, not just an action, you're pledging your whole being to the effort. It's a good question. Well, no, because frankly, in the law is actually it's what? There's absolutely no difference. You break a promise, that's it. You break a covenant, that's it. It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, in, in this, in the, the way the covenant are viewed, not only in uh, there are blessings and cursings attached with the covenant, and depending on whether they're um, unilateral, meaning that it's God to us, or the bilateral of us to God and God to us. Um, but yeah, there's a and, and to the point, you know, John Murray defines it very simply, a promise of solemn fidelity or sworn fidelity. Yeah, yeah. So, but Murray is, is looking at a biblical covenant and, uh, and the promise of sworn fidelity. Now, where that becomes important is when we think about the covenant that um, Hosea keeps referring back to. What covenant did they break? Did they break Abraham's covenant? Well, man, never be. Because it's a, it's a unilateral, meaning it's a from God only covenant. And it's a, it's a without end covenant. It's an eternal covenant. It's a covenant without end, without being broken whatsoever, because it's God's promises to us. It's God's promises based on his faithfulness and his character to us as we as, as inheritors of that. Now, so we refer to it not as the Abrahamic covenant, but rather he's referring to the Mosaic covenant. We looked last week, a couple, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at that picture of Mount Ebal to the north and Mount Gerizim to the south, or a little bit to the Northeast and Southwest, but those promises that were promises and cur those blessings and curses that they made. And when I, I think I said a word last week, and I don't know if I explained it. When I said antiphonal, everybody familiar with what antiphonal is? Okay, so antiphonal is when you, you kind of have one person saying something and, and the next person responds back. So a declaration and a declaration and a declaration and a declaration. And so they were busy rehearsing the curses and the, and the blessings. That's it. You would have been on Mount Gerizim, the Mount Gerizim crowd, yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, they, they, busy, uh, they busily shared the promises, and they said, you know, we'll, this is where Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, Joshua, you know, as for me and my house will serve the Lord, he's calling the nations to remember that this promise and this covenant is being made as they rehearse the covenant, even separate from what had gone on in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. Um, the idea of a unilateral covenant by God to man, but it's, it can be either unilateral man to God as well, like a vow or something. It's, it's weak. True. Like, what, we're, what we're counting on is the covenant of God is God. And yeah. He can't quite count the same way on us. It's, right. Yeah. And we, it's still, it's still both. Yeah, we can, unilateral, unilateral. yeah, we can make the promise, but. The, the likelihood of us being able to fill it completely are so so depend on the will of our or the strength of our will, so to speak. So. Yeah, I mean, Paul would make a, a vow, and it's very appropriate that Paul would make a vow as he's heading back from um, Corinth and Ephesus. He makes a vow that he's going to uh, make uh, make the money, bring the money, and give it to the church there, and he makes a vow to appear in the temple. Uh, and so it's very appropriate to do for to someone to make a promise. So as we get to this section. Uh, when he says, listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, um, this section really begins at a spot where the, the covenant is being shattered. The covenant is being shattered. The prophetic lawsuit um, that begins here in verses one through three generally includes four elements. And by that, I mean, so it's like they, they all went to um, prophet, prophet school and they learned how to make um, they learn how to make prophetic calls and prophetic lawsuits. They're entering a judgment on behalf of God to the people, and it follows a particular pattern. Just as much as covenants uh, followed a particular pattern, um, the whole lawsuit aspect does as well. There were four things that were meant to do. First of all is the call to hear and the summons to trial. The second thing is the specific charges or accusations of sin committed. 
The third thing is evidence proper. And the fourth thing is the verdict or announcement of judgment. And so this is what you find going on in chapters four and five. It's a lawsuit entered by God that he's bringing evidence in order to discharge and release himself from the covenant because the Israelites had, had broken the covenant. They'd broken the terms of the covenant. And so you can't break the promises. You can't be the recipient of a unilateral covenant, an unconditional covenant, but you can on a conditional covenant, on a bilateral covenant. And that's what, that's what the Israelites had done. Just, just put in your notes, it's called uh, excusing of performance. Performance is in, in the 21st century? Is it? You know, if you fall out of the doctrine, the you look, you know, you preached. So I'm excused from performance. Yeah. And that's that's exactly what he's bringing the lawsuit yeah. to, to make that point. So so we're going to look at it with that in mind. So let's let's uh let's look at it in uh, in this respect. Verses 4 or verse chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. There's a call to hear, listen to the words of the Lord, O sons of Israel. Again, it's a very simple introduction. Sounds like it's sounds like it's not that formal, but he's following the pattern that he's supposed to do. And there's a summons to trial, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. Second thing, there's a charge or an accusation. And he says, there, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. So if I were Israel, or if we were all Israel, we'd be sitting up and taking notice here going, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> One of the prophets is starting to bring a lawsuit. What's going on here? And, and yet they really wouldn't do a whole lot. Uh, they, would, they would, again, we'll, we'll look at the, the, the total here in a little bit. Um, there, the third thing is there's evidence, and, and God says that there's swearing. And God, does, he doesn't mean cursing here. He means there's false promises being made. There's deception. There's murder. There's stealing. There's adultery. Um, and then he says, and then there's the verdict of consequences. Therefore, the land mourns. And everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and also the fish of the sea disappear. There are curses upon the land. The land mourns. And that's part of the evidence that now the covenant is broken. That's what we're living in now, verse two. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, without without question. We're and and you kind of have to ask yourself the question. We're not in the same situation. We don't have the same kind of covenant with the Lord. But does that mean he's exempt from bringing a lawsuit against us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it you find all of these same elements of God calls us to hear. God calls us to sit up and listen, and He has a case against the inhabitants of the land. I mean, the thing that comes to mind, of course, would be abortion. Uh, just as one particular case. Um, there's no faithfulness. There's no kindness. There's no knowledge of God in the land. Um, back to the third thing, there's going to be evidence. There'll be swearing. There'll be oaths taken. There's deception. There's murder, sealing, adultery, all the things that lead to why the abortion in the first place. And then, of course, the, the consequences that are upon the land. What knowledge is you mean knowledge of God, that God exists or not, or knowledge of who God is. Both. Yeah. Both knowledge of who God is and the knowledge that God exists. And so it's an intimate knowledge. It meant to be an intimate knowledge. Right. Yeah. Um, I want you to turn back to, to Romans chapter eight. Long before I get to do um, the whole book of Romans, which we'll do at some point in time, I actually want to take some time at some point in time to actually do Romans chapter eight. Um. So if we look at um, verse 9 of chapter 8, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, Romans 8, verse 9. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. This is, a, this is a marvelous statement, right? God indwells within us and gives us life. So then, brethren, we're under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if the spirit you're putting to death, the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you've not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And the spirit testifies, himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. 
And if children heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may be glorified with him. Um, now go move on down to verse 22. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. For the creation was subjected. Um, why am I skipping around? Verse 18. <laughs> For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. Now we can go on, but you get the point that all of creation, until Jesus comes back, all of creation groans under the penalty and the futility of sin, right? And you, saw, you sort of see this in miniature come about here. So you, we've seen the call to hear, we've seen the charge of accusation, we've seen the evidence, and we see the verdict and consequences. So what seems to mark these declarations or lawsuits is that they're collections of prophecies that are given over time. You don't think uh, Hosea sat down and gave them all all at once. This kind of spans a 30 or 40 year time frame. Um, but here's the accusations. Well, first of all, there's no faithfulness. Um, let's go back. There's no faithfulness. And by faithfulness, faithfulness describes God's character, but not the people's at all, does it? Even though they were made in his image, um, let me say it again. The faithfulness describes God's character, but not the people, even though they're made in his image and not people who call themselves children of God. There's a lack of truth telling. There's a lack of truth doing, if you will. The nation is corrupt in the way that they're handling themselves. There's no faithfulness. There's no loving kindness. There's loving kindness describes God's characters, but not the people made in his image, nor the people who call themselves children of God. So the people of Israel call themselves children of God, but they're not acting like it, not thinking like it, not loving like it, not behaving like it. There's a lack of concern for neighbors. There's, there's a lack of what's, what the Hebrews called hesed, the loyal, the loyal, loyal love, the whole loving kindness that's shown to his people. And third of all, there's no knowledge. And this is not just an intellectual assent, but living with God, knowing him as Lord. No knowledge of who God is, no knowledge of what God has done for his people, nor what God requires of them as part of the covenant. So verses one through three are really the kind of first condemnation out the gate that this is not going to go well for all the prophecies that Hosea has for them. Now, verses four through 10, um, as we continue on, um, but you know, let no one find fault and let none offer reproof for your people are like those who contend with the priest. So you shall stumble by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you from being my priest, since you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. The more they multiply, the more they sinned against me, I will change their glory into shame. Let's, let's actually stop at verse right there. So one of the things that you should catch is the word yet. Yet, in some versions, I think the uh, New American Standard, ESV, say yet. Um, CSB, or the CS, CSB, yeah. Um, the, um, that's the Baptist Bible, and uh, NIV, I think, both say but. But you, but you see there's a transition from the condemnation, the accusation, the judgment. Now you say yet. God is, is kind of changing the topic just a little bit. So the, this regardless, this, this begins a new section. And it places the blame for the sins squarely on the shoulders of the priests. Right? So we're, we're moving from the people who kind of have had a hand in this. We've talked about that over the last several weeks. But we're moving from the people to specifically the priests, the leaders of, of, the, of the nation. Um, verse 6 uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Since you rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of God, law of your God, and I also forget your children. Now, remember how the priests got to be priests? 
They were Levites. They had to be sons of, of priests, right? So if, if God is saying, I reject you and your children, what's he saying about what's going to happen to priests? They're just going to be rejected and they will begin to wither away, right? You know, verse, verse 8 says, they feed on the sins of my people and long for their wrongdoing. Now, the, the lack of knowledge of God, even though they were priests meant to carry the word of God <coughs> to the people, the lack of knowledge of God began to just destroy the people. Uh, the priests have been entrusted with a treasure, but they squandered it. They've not shared it. They've hidden it under a bushel, and they've failed to lead by example. And the condemnation starts with the leaders. Now, that's the way it always is, isn't it? As the, as the leaders go, so goes the church. We still say that today. And it's still a true statement. All the more important that as we select leaders for the church, we understand that there's a character qualification for them of what kind of people they're going to be. And not what kind of character they're going to be only, but what kind of character they're going to be in reflection of what kind of character they've been. You don't just get a title because you are reached a certain age. You get a title because you've reached a certain state of being, certain predictability, certain faithfulness uh, to the word of God. Um, so the condemnation um, starts with the leaders. The condemnation also reverses the promises. Um, it, it brings curses, and now comes the opposite. Instead of protection, they're going to be perishing or destroyed. Instead of loyalty, they're rejected, you and your priests. Instead of knowing, there's forgetting. Now, I was, I'm amazed at this. One, in terms positively, when we think about our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God chooses not to bring our sins back up. And in fact, he says, I will remember them no more, which always causes me a little bit of, because can God forget? No. But what that means is that God chooses not to remember, which is much more enjoyable to think about in a certain <laughs> sense. That God chooses not to remember the sins when we confess them. Because we're children of God, we bring those sins and we confess them, and God doesn't hold them against us any longer. And that restores us. It makes us, we looked at this a little while ago, that makes us useful again, fit for the kingdom, fit for purpose. Um, any of you, have any of you ever used a, uh, a tool for a purpose for which it was not meant? <laughs> like how many of you have used a, a, uh, a screwdriver to try and hammer in a nail? <laughs> right? Um, when, when we have unconfessed sins, we're like that. We're, we're almost, a, a, almost like a screwdriver trying to hammer in a nail. We're not useful for the purpose we're intended. Right? We're useful for nothing in a lot of respects. But when we confess our sins, <coughs> we're, be, we're made useful again. And God himself says, I'm going to remember your sins no more. He takes our sins and puts them far away as the east is from the west. It's this metaphor of not only do I choose not to re remember them to you or to myself, but I'm going to put them away as to never be brought back. John? The idea about um, unconfessed sins. I always think that the Jesus about that David. He gets called on the carpet by uh, Nathan, right? Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, it's me. How in the world could, you know, how can you possibly forget that you did something like that? And I, you know, I believe it. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. But the idea is like, I don't know how I could possibly. I can say, well, all right, I didn't, I didn't say literally to God, I did this and that. Yeah. Is well, that all, that all we're talking about? No, let me, let me give you this metaphor of, of David's life. If you look at David's life, it was a continual ascension of all the things that David did, of the conquering of kingdom, of the slaying of Goliath. Well, let me go back, of the, the capturing of the herds and being a shepherd and understanding what that means, of, of conquering Goliath, of leading the nation and even evading death by, by Saul's intent, now, of marrying, marrying rightly, of everything David did up until a certain point, we're all ascending in his, both his righteousness and his adoration of even God himself. But with the, with the um, pregnancy of Bathsheba and the adultery in Bathsheba, it all begins a downward trend. Now, that doesn't mean that David's cut off, but there's a certain spot where his pride 
got to him and he assumed that no one's going to know and no one's going to care. And so he began, he began like somebody else to start having not a knowledge of God that's intimate and daily anymore. Right. He cut himself off from God. God didn't cut himself off ever from David. But lest we be too hard on David, God has still called David a man after his own heart, right? right? So in a lot of respects, he's like us when we sin. We can be this like this, and you know, by the age of 35, be glorious in our in our professions or, or whatever thing we're putting our hand to. But when we start to get proud, it's going to be nothing but but really blessings and cursings for us. Okay, so the not confessing part doesn't mean that David didn't know it. It means somehow that he didn't submit to God under those circumstances. Correct. Correct. Right. Did, did not submit to God. Exactly so. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the, instead of forgetting, or instead of knowledge then, God is going to do the forgetting. The priesthood were hereditary. So forgetting the children means that the, the work of the corrupt priests comes to an end. So what's kind of interesting is that here in chapter 7, we start to switch from not just the priests, but the priests' children. Because who was corrupting the, the children? The priests. They weren't being taught how to lead. They were being taught how to be corrupt. And so he, you know, the children comes to an end, which means the priesthood comes to an end. The priests failed to share what they knew so the people could know and know that they're, and now that the children were cut off, all the people of God are cut off. So via these, these two, op, uh, let's see, uh, who said this? Um, Douglas Stewart said, via these two, op, or these polar opposites, God turns the table against the priests for their abuse of the covenant stipulations. God is busy turning the tables and making an example out of them that you want a relationship with me? This is not that. This is not that way. Now, an extended passage in, in Deuteronomy chapter 31 says, so Moses wrote this law, Deuteronomy 31 verse 9. So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And to all the elders of Israel, then Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of the release of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, at the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel so that they hear it. Guess what the priests were not doing? They didn't know what it was. They didn't know where to find it. Remember when, when Josiah, Josiah comes a little bit later, right? Remember one of the things that, that strikes Josiah when he's busy reading the word? They were supposed to practice the Passover. Right. And he's, he's looking and going, Passover, what's this Passover thing I'm reading about? Right? They're, they had not been practicing it, both in Israel and even Ju in Judah. So again, uh, verse 12 of, of Deuteronomy 31, assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, and the stranger who is in your town, so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God. And be careful to follow all the words of the, of the Lord your God, as long as you live on the land which you're about to cross the Jordan, to will assess. They had not done what they promised to do. Because later on, they would say, we're going to do all these things. When we get to Joshua and Joshua, and he's up in the northern part with Ebal and Gerizim. We looked at that last week. He's up there and, and he, he actually says, you know, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And the rest of Israel says, yeah, we will too. Yeah. And Joshua's going, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Being away from God's people this part, I don't know if you're going to do it or not. No, 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 really, we're going to do it. Yeah. All right. So back at verse 7 uh, in, in Hosea 4. The more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me, the more they, they is the children, by the way. The nearest antecedent. This is your English language. This is why it's always important to get your English straight, which I didn't do uh, for the longest time. So the nearest antecedent is the children. I, for, I will also forget your children, verse 6. The more they multiply, the children, the more they sinned against me, meaning that they're carried on their father's sins. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. And it will be like people, like priests. Like people, like priests. Everybody is, is full of swearing. Everybody's full of iniquity. Everybody's full of promises unfulfilled. 
Everybody's full of sin. Like people, like priests, so I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat and not have enough, and they will pay, play the harlot, but not increase, because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. So, the, again, there were, there were three conditions of the northern priesthood that seem, as you look at this passage, especially verse 7. First of all, they were, the, they were wealthy. When it says, the more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. The more they multiplied means, almost literally, the, more, the richer they became. It certainly it increased in volume in terms of number of people, the, the priests having children. But it referenced also to their wealth and the richer they became. Increase is really a reference to money. And then the second thing is, it says, when they, when they sinned, the more they sinned against me. They rejected God's word. They invented their own. They began to merge the pagan religions with the, the religion of God, the religion of, of, uh, of Yahweh. And so they were not, they were not orthodox, and now they were heterodox, almost heretical. And then, and then finally, he says in verse 7, their glory they treated. They were degenerates. They were no longer in it for God's glory and, and looking at the promises as something not earned but gladly received. They were looking at God's not being good enough to us. In fact, we're afraid of God. You talk about fear of the Lord, we're afraid of God. How's that for that? That's not what that means. <laughs> One of the books I'm reading right now, it's by a guy named Michael Reeves, and, uh, and we'll talk about, uh, I'll get done, I'll give you a book report for it. Um, but it's, uh, it's on the fear of the Lord and what that means. And it's a joyous book. I mean, it's a delightful book. Uh, so it gives you a kind of review. I'm going to give it a good review because I'm really enjoying it so far. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. Mark, huh. this reminds me of Adam and Eve because they, they walked with him every day until they sinned. And all of a sudden they were hiding from him. He came. And, and the way they sinned, God's not being good enough to us. He's withholding to us something we think we deserve. So now we get to uh, the, the, the children again in verse seven. By the time we get to the end of verse seven, now the children are referred to in the third person and plural. What began with the priests continues with the children. And the more the children of the priests multiplied and became priests themselves, the more the sins multiplied. Having children should have been a glory. It should have been a blessing. It should have made righteousness increase. Instead, just exactly the opposite. Uh, but their, their behavior and their leader and leading of the rest of Israel astray is instead their shame. And verse 9 summarizes it and he says, like people, like priests. The priests exhibit the same character as the nation and will endure a similar fate. Next section is verses 11 to 14. Um, so let me get to uh, 11 to 14. Uh, let's see. Harlotry, wine, and new wine take away the understanding. My people consult their wooden idol, and their diviner's wand informs them. For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have played the harlot, departing from their God. They offer sacrifices on the tops of the mountains, and burn incense on the hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters play the harlot, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot or your brides when they commit adultery for the men themselves go apart from har with harlots and offer sacrifices with temple prostitutes. So the people without understanding are ruined. Now, if you're from the South, you might say ruined. <laughs> <laughs> so again, verses 4, 11 to 14, the practice of idol worship begins to replace the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. I read from Isaiah this morning in our, in our worship service. And what does it say about the fear of the Lord? It's, ob it's an obvious reference to Jesus. Um, so back to, now we're going to turn here. You thought, you didn't know there would be a pop quiz on something I said an hour and a half ago. Didn't you? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 11. And this is Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 4. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, 
the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And what's the next verse say? He will delight in the fear of the Lord. This is talking about Jesus who, when he comes. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not being afraid. The fear of the Lord is understanding who God is. And you've heard it said, uh, I'll give you just a hint. You know, one of the chapters in the book goes to fear of the Lord is more just than just our polite reverential awe. That's inadequate way to describe what the fear of the Lord is. But it's the thing when we rejoice in being in God's presence, when we rejoice at understanding we're serving the master who has saved us, who redeemed us, that's the fear of the Lord. The one who's brought us blessings and the one who brings us cursings. There is a certain aspect where there is fear if we cross it. What's that? Yes, that's right. <laughs> but there's, as Jesus said, he's going to delight in the fear of the Lord. All right. Um, so um, the, the fear of the Lord turns into being afraid. And no longer do the people seek God and the creator of all. They turn to idolatry to escape God. They turn to idolatry to escape their imagination or the notion of him. They are no longer faithful, but faithless. Now, verse 13 mentions, um, mentioning the places where idol worship was done. On the tops of mountains, on hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, tall trees, especially around Shechem. Single trees, straight trees. These are trees that were great for idol worship. And so they invented and, and, and created a new class of, of worship there. What it does strike me is that who's accountable in verse 14? Is it the women who get into trouble? It's the men. Let that inform your abortion debate. Verse 15 to 19. Uh, not in Isaiah. <laughs> I forgot to turn back. It's well, my Bible starting to get to where now it opens to Hosea. That's a good, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, 15 to 19. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, do not let Judah become guilty. Also, do not go to Gilgal or go up to Beth Aven and take the oath as the Lord lives. Now, I do want to give you just a here's your geography lesson for the day. All right, so can you see that a little bit? Sort of. I don't know why it's off the side like that. But anyway, um, give me a lesson to where these people are. All right, so there's Jericho. All right, so the reason that Jericho's uh, in verse 13, will be, or verse 15, um, you shall not go to Gilgal. Gilgal is just north of Jericho. I mean, just within like a mile and a half or two miles, right? Uh, they'll also go to Bethel. Now it says Beth Aven, right? Beth Aven means the house of nothingness. Nothingness versus the house of versus the house of God. Now Bethel is is the house of God. who was it was Jacob, right? Yeah, he wrestled with God there. This is the house of God. Bethel is right near the city of Ai, which was torn about because there people wanted to put household. Well, you get the story. So Gilgal was really a center of worship. Um, uh, it was about one mile north of Jericho. And if you go back to the book of Amos, which again, Amos and, and Hosea are peers of each other prophesying at the same time. Um, Amos touches on the, the idol centers as far south as Beersheba, which is down here. Now we've touched on this before, but you remember if I say from Dan, can you, can you find out where Dan is? I don't have it highlighted. It's up there. Dan is way up north. It's the last city in the yellow part, right along the, the, the Jordan River. So sometimes you'll see it ref, you'll see something in scripture says from Dan to Beersheba. And from Dan to Beersheba is just a euphemism. Uh, there's an actual phrase for it. I can't remember it right off the top of my head. But from Dan to Beersheba is just another way of saying all of the nation of Israel. Okay. All right, so Gilgal is the center of worship. Beth Aben, it means the house of nothingness. And it was another word for Bethel, meaning the house of God, choosing the name and showing the reversal. God is choosing to rename it in order to say it's new, it's true new state. The people are without understanding they're just, and they're destroyed. Again, it's a warning to Judah to learn from the lesson of, of Israel. And sadly, they did not. Yeah. I just always found it interesting that, like you said here, 
I go they go you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. But all the kings of Judah, no, well, not all, but uh, many of them were always trying to reconcile with the kings of Israel, and it never went well. No, no, but and they, they just felt like even Josiah, you know, it's like, it's like, don't y'all get it? We're hanging out with those guys. Yeah, yeah, and that's going to come out in chapter five oh. as well, really quick. But it, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're right. It, they were always trying to play the heart, essentially. And Judah was supposed to, this, part of this lesson is actually to Judah. Uh, learn the lesson of what's going on with, Isaac, with uh, Israel. This could happen. This could be you. And, and, and it would be. Um, so let's see, verse, uh, verse 16. Since Israel, Israel is stubborn, like a stubborn heifer, can the Lord now pasture them like a lamb in a large field? Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their liquor gone. They play the harlot continually. Their rulers dearly love shame. The wind wraps them in its wings, and they will be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So one of the, one of the other things here is um, one more one more view is the nation or the city of Mizpah. Now, what's really interesting to me is, and I didn't realize this until some of the commentaries put it out. These are all spots where Mizpah. Anybody know what the significance of Mizpah? What's that? Samuel's from there. Oh, okay. oh. Um, Samuel's from there, and we get into the, let's see, the next one. Tabor. You want to know what the significance of Tabor is for? Yeah, because Judah didn't follow through on his promise, right? Didn't follow through on his promise, and Deborah judged there. Mm -hmm. So what Jose is doing is actually ref reflecting back to the judges and saying these were people supposed meant to be the leaders and they were godly leaders but the things that are going on here now is in complete contrast to the prophets or i'm sorry the the judges of old what's going on here now is unrighteousness completely um let's see so again like a stubborn cow um this is not flattering. that's not flattering. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not something you say in some of Christmas would it be? <laughs> oh, look, a stubborn cow. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Since Israel is a stubborn cow, like a stubborn heifer, uh, can the Lord now pasture them? So it's kind of a rhetorical question. Will the Lord pasture them, shepherd them, patient? It's kind of pasture means bringing idea of the pastoral aspect of being shepherding kindly, gently, lovingly, causing the, the animals to go and need, eat where they need to eat and, and get rest and shelter when they need to get rest and shelter. And instead, God says, nope, we're not going to do that. I am done. My patience is gone. I'm, I'm finished. All right. All right. So now chapter five, and we're going to go through much quicker in chapter five, probably because I only got 10 minutes left. <laughs> uh, but this, again, where it becomes kind of a, a high level view. So verses one to seven. The leadership is, is culpable. The, the covenant's shattered. The leadership is culpable. He says, listen, priests. Verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this, O Israel. Give heed, O house of Israel. I'm sorry. Hear this, O priests. Give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, O house to the king. For the judgment applies to you, for you have been a snare at Mizpah. Now, Mizpah, what's really interesting is that right here, Mizpah and um one more slide here. Gibeah, Rama, and Bethel. They're all cities that are right on the border between, I think it's Ephraim and, and Benjamin. And they're kind of like, they would, they would tend to, those are kind of like the gate cities. The cities that would not want, if the cities are going to be, if the north is going to be conquered, they're going to come this direction through these cities. And as, this, as the nation in, of Israel gets into idolatry, it's going to come through these cities as well. And so it's almost a warning of um, be, be on your guard over your gates. So he says, listen, priests, house of the king, it's, and it's leadership who's accountable again. We, we touched on that before. The priest continues the emphasis in chapter four and yet swings the attention from the chief priest in, in chapter four, verses four to six, to the entire company who failed to enforce the covenant stipulations. The house of Israel is most likely the entire northern kingdom, and the house of the king probably includes the administrative bureaucracy. So everybody involved in, in making sure the king can do what kings do. 
Mizpah is where Samuel judged, Tabor is where Deborah judged. And then in this section, Hosea is giving notice that based on the earlier legal case, that the covenant is gone. The covenant is over. So verse three, um, I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, again, Ephraim sometimes used as a, just another word for Israel. It's the one tribe, but meaning the whole, all 10 tribes of the world. Um, I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the harlot. Israel has defiled itself. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God for a spirit of harlotry is within them and they do not know the Lord. That is um, terrifying to be so deep in sin yeah. that you no longer, it's like a point of no return. And there is a point we just never know what is yeah. a person. We never know there is a point of no return. And it's, yeah. you know, it, it is interesting to me that as the nation of Israel gets thrown into, gets into idolatry and they get carried away because of the idolatry into Assyria. And as the nation of in Judah really does the same thing, both with the child sacrifice of their children, infanticide. And um, when they get carried off into Babylon, they come back, neither nation, neither group anymore, none of the 12 tribes is not involved with idolatry whatsoever. I mean, so they did learn the lesson. It just had to be that painful in order to, to do it. So uh, five verse three. Um, so Gibeah again is is the home of King Saul, uh, just north of Jerusalem. Uh, if you go with Bookman, you'll go to Gibeah. Um, you'll stand on the place where the King of Jordan uh, back in 1967 or 68, 66 um, was going to build a, a palace, and then the 1967 war happened, and so um, Israel took that spot over. So now it's just an empty shell. Uh, it's, it's there. You'll get to visit that. Uh, tr blow a trumpet in Rama. Rama is the hometown of Samuel. Uh, Mizpah, where, he, where Samuel was a judge, uh, Rama is where he was the uh, was the hometown of Samuel. Uh, Rama would be where uh, a guy named Joseph, who had the who took the body of Jesus from. What was his name? Joseph of what? Arimathea. 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 Right? But it's the new name for <laughs> Rama. <laughs> so you see, he, he's only about five miles or so from there. Wow. Right? Uh, so these towns straddle the border between Israel and Judah, and there are warning to Judah how close the calamity will come. Judah itself will not escape being harassed. Uh, verses 8 to 11. Blow the trumpet in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, sound an alarm at beth -Aven. Behind you, Benjamin, Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I would declare what is sure. Uh, so 8 to, 8 to 11 um, kind of declares, a, uh, highlights the struggle between Judah and Israel. Um, what also seems to be happening is that some landowners are near the northern tribes or the north, in Benjamin are trying to grab some land while Israel's not looking or having some trouble. They're trying to move the boundary markers. Like, you know, if I grabbed another acre or two, no one will notice. <laughs> right? Um, so they're moving the boundary markers, which is really passive aggressive and petty. But under, if you read Deuteronomy uh, 27, 17, that places you under God's curse when you're stealing land. Um, the king's not mentioned, and so he doesn't seem to be, um, doesn't seem to be an invasion, but just a land grab of a few acres here and there by the locals. And then he goes into, um, let's see, where am I? Nine, ten. Uh, ten, yeah, the princes of Judah um, have become like those who move a boundary. Or on them I will pour out my wrath like water. So stealing land is not a good thing. <laughs> uh, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to follow man's command. Therefore, I make him like a moth to Ephraim, like rottenness to the house of Judah. And I'll come back to that. Um, I'm looking for the spot where we talk about the ram's horn. Did I pass it? Yeah verse, yeah, verse eight. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Both of those are instruments of war. So there, it's, not a, it's not an insignificant um, visual metaphor. Um, the, the trumpet and the ram's horn are the, the alarms for war. In the role of the watchman, the prophet shouts the battle alarm and calls for both kinds of, of trumpets. Ram's horn, you see that in Joshua 6 and 2 Samuel chapter 2, uh, Amos chapter 3. You also see the silver bugle or the silver trumpet 
which is in Numbers chapter 10. And it sounds that there's a dangerous danger signal and they're alerting all who's there. In this case, again, Ephraim is a, is a proxy for all of Israel. And so it's a declaration of how far they sin and now war is about to occur. Um, how corrupt is Ephraim? Um, verse 13, um, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and said to King Jerob, but he's unable to heal you or to cure you from your wound. Meaning that in the midst of the trouble, when they know the trouble is coming, instead of saying, let's go to God and entreat him, he's our protector. They turn away from God as if they're afraid of God and they turn right straight into the arms of the enemy. Right? The invading army, they went there saying, can you help us? <laughs> As before, the people had no regard for delighting in the Lord. They were afraid and ran into the arms of the enemy. And they, they became like water. How corrupt is Ephraim? He says, therefore, I'm like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. And the word translated moth could also refer to a maggot in an open wound or to pus, right? So it's not like a, it's a pretty visual metaphor, yeah. Um, the word for rot describes something that causes decay. Since the, since the metaphor is extended into verse 13, it relates to a disease or a wounded body and not the clothing. Moth is probably not the intended sense here. Um, they, we therefore should envisage a wounded man left unattended whose injuries fester in the most horrible manner. A, a better translation would be, I'm like a maggot to Ephraim and like gangrene to the house of Judah. Ooh. Anybody get a sense that this is going well? <laughs> All right. Verse 14, the emphasis becomes on I, for I will be like lion to Ephraim and like the young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away and there will be none to deliver. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So they're going to turn to the arms of the enemy and saying, help us. We don't, we're not even, we're not even aware that God would have care. Right. But they're afraid of God and they turn to the enemy. The enemy does take them away and God lets them go. So again, we see the things coming to fruition. So chapters four and five are all about the, the judgment to come. But as we've looked at this cycle of, first of all, there's judgment, then there's restoration. And that's when we come to chapter six, verses one through three. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days, and he will raise up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us now know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Now, both of these are, are really, um, well, so this is a really a, an oracle or prophecy of restoration. But what must they do in order to receive the restoration? Two things, acknowledge guilt, and seek God's face. That means to practice the fear of the Lord. The, the idea that I'm enjoying being into his presence of not having my sins remembered anymore, both to my conscience and to my ears. And both of these are summarized by in their distress, they will search for me. God's, they will search for me. God's absence is the final response of the curses. And sometimes you don't realize what you're about to lose until it's too late. And God follows through on his condemnation and promises. He withdraws and no longer protects, but then the opportunity to repent comes about. And God is shown to be the God who is faithfully waited. Now, verse 2 says, uh, after two days, um, raised, raised us on the third day. And it's not likely meant to be literal, as in literally two days here. Uh, but it does include a fixed time. What's interesting to me is it would be nearly two centuries before Israel would come back. And I think that's, I'm not sure if that's coincident or not, but you also see kind of echo here of Jesus's resurrection yeah. after two days and then raised on the third day. And I think that's intentional. Um, it would be almost two centuries before the people come back to the land of Judah, but again, typologically, could be a reference to the resurrection of Jesus or both. 
Um, so we see other restorations such as the Valley of Dry Bones that happening in Ezekiel 37. This is just another example of that. So verse three, as we, as we kind of wind down here. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Um, Jesus' appearance, or God's appearance, is as sure as the dawn. As sure as the sun rises, um, God will come back to heal his people when we confess our sins, when we seek the face of the Lord. The rain, which uh, again is, is mentioned in verse three, uh, gives relief to a parched land. Heavy rain, of course, is unusual in Israel. Depending on where you are, up in, up in the northern mountains, in Mount Hermon and um, Mount Hermon in this area, way up at the top, near, up north of the Sea of Galilee in that area, they might, Sea of Galilee might see 20 inches a year. Up Mount Hermon might see 60 inches a year. But down here, you might see four, eight inches a year. And the way they get moisture is actually the moisture on the winds coming to the, sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Um, moisture or rain is, is a precious, precious uh, commodity. Um, and but the rain, the promises here is the rain, the rain that brings release, relief. Um, one time, again, one time when we were there in, in we were there in June. I think that was the second time they were there. Um, there was a lot of talk because it rained every day for like two or three days. And it usually doesn't rain in June. It usually rains in like July or August. It just doesn't happen. So people were relieved because it brought relief from the, the temperatures. So now we can, we can kind of see that there. So as we bring things to a close, we can find ourselves, lest we you know, go about pointing saying, they deserve to be punished. There's an aspect we can do that too. We can be like the nation of Israel, not reflecting on the character of God, even though we're ambassadors of God, even though we're children of God. We can fail to forgive like we've been forgiven. We can fail to love like we've been loved. We can fail to show loving kindness, that faithful, loyal love like we've been forgiven. And we follow our own idols, our own desire, our own passions, as James tells us, running to them instead of running to God. And in that way, we become exactly like Israel. And we had nothing but condemnation ahead of us, if that's the case of God setting us aside. And we, we follow our own idols. We, we run to something else besides God, and God seems to go silent. But the way path, the path back is simple. It's confess your sins and draw near to the Lord. And we find out that while we're drawing near to the Lord, he's actually been pursuing us the entire time. While we close in prayer, um, and, I'm, and I've got like three or four pictures from graduation to show you. So we'll, we'll close it off uh, that, first, that part first. So, Father, we thank you for, again, the day. And, and uh, even though we've gone through this passage kind of quickly, we see uh, your passion to, to bring your people to yourself and yet understanding that it will be judgment. It will be uh, this process of, of going silent with the nation that will uh, be needed in order to bring them to repentance. And yet, Lord, we know that many came back um, and never practiced idolatry again. Father, we're, we're thankful for their the example that happened to us or to them. It is an example to us. Father, bring our hearts to know you, to confess our sins, to follow after you, and to delight in your in the fear of the Lord. Uh, be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um,